Hi, my name is Melissa Clark, and I decided to do my final video project on Venetian glass blowing. I went to the Getty Museum earlier this summer for the museum project and was really inspired by all the glass objects they had, so I thought I might as well do a research project and get more out of it than I thought I could. So, to understand Venetia's, Venetian glass blowing, it is necessary to have some background on it. Glassmaking was an art that had risen to a new level in the countries of the Middle East, usually in Syria, Egypt, and Palestine, and also Venice. Looking outwards to the sea, as always, was fertile soil for the specialized skills of the trade. One of the most noted places of modern times in connection with the manufacturer of glass in Venice. It has been said that the origin of glassmaking there was contemporary with the foundation of the city in the 5th century, but it was from the end of the 13th century that the industry became of importance to the world. It was at the most brilliant period of the history of Venice as a city, as maritime power, as trading and commercial center. Glass didn't just get popular when it came to the art form of glass blowing. Glass was used in many ways before this. The Romans had used glass cut from a molded piece rather than blown for illumination in bathhouses, in what was probably one of the first glass furnaces of a Venetian island, dating from the 8th century, 8th century so archaeologists think was discovered in the 1960s. Not on Murano, however, but on its more important neighbor in those days, the island of Torcello. The fact that glass blowing was more an eastern skill than a European one played in Venice's favor as it along with its better rival, Genoa. Genoa had the best connections to that area. The popularity of Venetian glass in the 15th and 16th century was fueled by its expertise in producing gl clear glass. The clear glass was called Cristallo, or the white glass mimicking porcelain, Latimo. The practice of enam enameling glass, which had or originally spread from the Middle East, was also highly popular at the time. Venetian mirrors, too, were in great demand. According to Keith Farrell, that centrality resulted in great wealth and influence for Venice. As a result, Venice's governing body, the Grand Council, relocated all glassmaking enterprises to the island of Murano in an effort to keep secret the mastery of glassmaking and related technologies, and who violated the code of secrecy faced penalties including execution, just for glass blowing. The evident prosperity of the Glassmakers Guild on Murano, of course, attracted attempts at competition elsewhere in Europe and Italy, and Venice was forced to intensify its carrot-and-stick approach to the industry. The ranks of the master and assistant glassblower were opened up to allow non-residents and honorary citizenship of Murano. Subjects to the same rights and restrictions, of course, and at the same time steps were taken to close glass furnaces operating in other parts of the territory controlled by the Venetian Republic by force. In this time of its great popularity, Murano was visited by the crown heads, popes, and the leading businessmen of the time. Everyone was attracted by the glass blowing business and was fascinated to learn more, even the royals. The next thing I wanted to talk about was the process of glass blowing to make you understand the glass blowing industry a little more. So, first, there is a furnace in which the glass is melted, then, they put it on a place where the glass blower forms his or her work. Step two, the artist takes the heated glass on the, glow, on the blow pipe and rolls it over the color, picking up pieces with each roll. The colors are usually in forms of powder and they roll the glass in them over and over again. Step three, the artist has to keep up constant motion to work the glass into its desired shape. They have like iron rods and holes that they put the glass in to keep to make circular shapes or whatever shape they desire. Step four, blow into the glass for the first time. They start with one puff on the end of the blowpipe to create a bubble. After the artist repeats the step of heating, color, and shaping till their piece is complete. Then, step five, transfer to the putney. I mean, put, punty, sorry. Punty is an iron rod used to shape or mold the glass. And then step six is to cool the glass, and it should be done at that point. All right, so the first piece of art I wanted to talk about was from the most prominent glassblower for his time in Venice. His name is Angelo Borriver. Around 1450, Angelo discovered how to accomplish what that appeared miraculous to most people. Perfectly clear, transparent glass, or what they call in Italian, vetro cristiano. The discovery of crystal by the Venetian maestro Angelo 
Lowe Barry Auvert in 1450 added a new dimension to the industry. Crystal was not only attractively clear and luminescent, it was also easier to blow, mold, enamel, and paint. Venice began exporting custom-made glassware to fit the needs and tastes of their customers. Around the same time, Angelo created a beautiful glass object. They called it the Barrio Vera Wedding Goblet. It was made in the 1470s through the 1480s, the famous Barrio Vera Wedding Cup. This cup was a wedding present. It was a unique chalice made of dark blue ga- glass with golden polychrome enamel decorations, in which both the bride and the groom were depicted with two medallions. And it's hard to see exactly what is on the piece of glass, but it seems that both of them are on white horses, which I believe is to show their prestige and their beautifulness. Um, this piece is now being held at the Murano's Glass Museum, and it, I think everyone should go look at it. The second piece of artwork I would like to talk about is the one I saw at the many at the Getty Museum when I went and which really sparked my fascination for doing this project. This piece was created in Venice in the late in the late 16th or early 17th century. The piece is called the Filigrino Bottle or also known as Cut Rolf. The point of the narrow curved neck of the Cut Rolf is to help slow the pouring of its liquid. Widely popular in the 1500s and 1600s, Cut Rolf fin were likely also valued for their interesting sounds made when liquid came out. They and they are also for their elegant but also strange shapes they create. The Getty Museum writes it as the twisted white canes of opaque white glass that are blown into com- complex patterns known as vetro fili and vetro retorti. These lacy linear designs revolutionized the appearance of Venetian glass, and it was perfected in the mid-1500s. It quickly won admi- the admiration of a wealthy international clientele. In 1550, an eyewitness described the invention and fantasy offered by glasswakers at Murano, which is where most glass was made in Venice. I just wanted to say thank you for listening and watching this video. I really learned a lot about art that I wasn't expecting to learn this summer, so I just thank you for that. Have a great rest of your summer.